Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I am Jolie Braun, and I'm the curator of Modern Literature and Manuscripts at The Ohio State's Rare Books and Manuscripts Library, which collects, preserves, and provides access to literary and historical materials from medieval manuscripts to contemporary novels and zines. Um, a quick word about the structure of our event today. So we'll begin by talking um, with Stephen Heyman. He'll give us an overview of his biography of Lewis Bromfield and discuss how he discovered Bromfield and why he's still important today. Um, then Stephen and I will talk a bit about researching and writing his biography and his work with the Lewis Bromfield papers at the Rare Books and Manuscripts Library. And lastly, we'll have plenty of time for Q&A so I'll be keeping an eye on the Q&A box throughout the event, um, and you can type in your, your question at any point. So I'd like to now introduce our guest. Um, Stephen Heyman is the author of The Planter of Modern Life, Lewis Bromfield and the Seeds of a Food Revolution, the first major biography of the Pulitzer Prize winning writer, farmer, and environmentalist, Lewis Bromfield. Heyman was formerly a features editor at T, the New York Times style magazine. In addition to the Times, his articles have appeared in Esquire, Slate, Travel and Leisure, Vogue, W, and the Wall Street Journal. In 2018, he was named a fellow at the Leon Levy Center for Biography and a National Endowment for the Humanities Public Scholar. And I should note that The Planter of Modern Life was published by W.W. W. Norton in 2020, and a paperback edition will be released in September uh, to commemorate the 125th anniversary of Bromfield's birth. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Stephen. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Thank you um, for being here with me um, and um, for listening to, uh, to me talk a little bit about Lewis Bromfield, a name that may be familiar to you in Ohio. Um, but a name that was totally unfamiliar to me five years ago um, when I uh, began work on this book. Um, I happened to meet a lamb farmer in southwestern Pennsylvania named John Jameson, who himself is something of an elder statesman in the world of sustainable agriculture. And I was asking him why he, um, uh, an English major, decided to change course and get into farming in the 1970s. And he mentioned this guy, Bromfield, who had a farm that was quite famous um, in Ohio um, and who was uh, a, a really important voice in the early environmental and organic movement. So I was, I was very confused. Um, let me just go to the next slide here. Uh, this is the cover of my book. Um, I was confused because this name Bromfield didn't even ring a bell and I thought I knew most of the heroes of uh, early environmentalism and the organic movement, people like uh, J.I. Rodell, whose organic gardening magazine, you know, popularized organics, um, and uh, Rachel Carson, who first um, kind of woke up the country to the dangers of um, of, of pesticides in her book, Silent Spring. But I was wondering, you know, where does this Bromfield guy fit in? And I, I got home, I, I Googled him. Uh, I did some very cursory research and I just kind of got sucked into this amazing world um, because I found out that not only had Bromfield, you know, been one of the first voices to articulate some of the deep problems we have with our food system and our relationship with the land, he had also, um, oh, sorry, there's a, let me just close the door. There's noise coming from somewhere in my house. One second. <laughs> um, sorry about that. Anyways, um, so, so not only had Bromfield been this kind of um, a pioneer in terms of sustainable agriculture and environmentalism, he had also lived this extraordinary earlier life as a Pulitzer Prize winning lost generation novelist, hanging out in Paris between the wars with people like Ernest Hemingway and Gertrude Stein. So I was fascinated. I was like, how do these two, how do these two identities connect? 
um, you know, this, this lost generation novelist and, you know, hanging out in France, this agrarian pioneer uh, with a farm in Ohio. So I wanted to see um, how these things could be unified um, in, in the story of this um, one man's life. Uh, and I started uh, research um, and that, of course, a lot of that research was conducted at the, uh, at the library at OSU, uh, which my book wouldn't have been possible without the Bromfield papers there. But um, I chose to start the book in France, and I kind of begin with a um, uh, comparing Bromfield to two of his best known um, contemporaries. Um, on the left, you have Ernest Hemingway, and on the right, F. Scott Fitzgerald. And at the moment, these three um, young Midwestern novelists meet in Paris in 1925. Bromfield is in an interesting position in relation to them. So Hemingway is still trying to get his career off the ground. He was a former newspaper man. He was working on his first novel. Um, uh, Fitzgerald had just published The Great Gatsby, which today we know is kind of like this the quintessential great American novel. Um, but at the time, he was, he was deeply disappointed with his novel's weak performance. Um, and he actually wrote his, his editor, Maxwell Perkins, that winter um, asking if Gatsby was dead. Um, uh, he, he was so devastated by the, uh, the sales. But Bromfield was in a very strong position relative to them. And in fact, the New York Times would shortly pronounce him the best of all the young American novelists writing in that period. Um, you know, his books are, they typically are, uh, you know, feature these kind of, um, female heroines, these kind of proto-feminist characters trying to break free from their stultifying Midwestern backgrounds. Usually they do this by um, uh, moving to Europe or reconnecting with nature in some way. Um, uh, Bromfield, of course, moved to Europe. He moved to Paris in uh, 1925, as I mentioned. But instead of taking the kind of typical lost generation routes of renting uh, some garrets in Montparnasse, he gets this lavish apartment overlooking the Bois de Bologna, where he um, uh, paints landscapes in the park and goes on vacation. There's a photograph of him with the uh, writer Edna Ferber and hangs out in cafes. Um, and he thought that the delights of, of that city were inexhaustible. Um, mm, uh, his relationship with Ernest Hemingway, I think, is a very complicated and interesting one. And I spent some time in the book kind of comparing and contrasting them. You know, uh, Bromfield's third novel, uh, uh, Early Autumn, uh, came out the same week that Hemingway's first, The Sun Also Rises, appeared. And um, Early Autumn was the bestseller. Uh, it went on to win the, the Pulitzer Prize. The Sun Also Rises uh, was eventually seen as a masterpiece, of course, but um, it initially received some, some mixed reviews that Hemingway's hometown newspaper even dismissed as a bushel of sensationalism and triviality. Um, Hemingway and Bromfield were friends. Hemingway kind of cozied up to him and tried to um, use his connections to find a better publisher. Um, but he wrote these vicious letters to Fitzgerald, making fun of Bromfield's prose of his attempts at hospitality, um, really catty stuff that is fun to read, but I think um, shows Hemingway in a very uh, poor light. Um, anyways, Bromfield, you know, this is the, the, the point in, in my book when I kind of, where, where literature kind of takes a backseat to these questions about um, agriculture and the environment. And what I'm trying to argue over the course of the book is that, you know, even though we may not think of Bromfield for whatever the merits of the, you know, uh, of his novels, and we can discuss them, we may not think of him as a, as a modernist like Hemingway when it comes to literature. But I want you to kind of start to think about him as a, as a, as a creative modernist when it comes to agriculture. Um, and so the focus of the book kind of shifts at this point. And there's a shift that happens in Bromfield's life as well, where he moves out of the city, he kind of tires of the literary scene, and he settles in this provincial town called Saint-Lys, about 30 minutes north, where he um, can, starts renovating an old rectory along a river called the Nanette. And um, 
and then he begins to lay out a, a very elaborate garden there. Um, you can see some photographs. Uh, there's a picture of, of Bromfield taking, um, he's, he's photographing one of his Dahlia arrangements. And there's the Bromfield family below. Um, he had three girls and that's his wife, Mary. Um, and I wanna read to you, uh, uh, you know, this, this, this garden became um, a, a really popular kind of society attraction. Um, and it, it uh, all these interesting types of people would congregate there. Um, and they really were struck by how beautiful the place was. Uh, the horticulturalist Russell Page described it in his memoir. Um, he said, he wrote, Lewis spent uh, hours every day working in his own garden, which bursting with roses and lilies and healthy clumps of herbaceous plants was the despair of all those who relied on paid gardeners. I think his was the only garden in France where the hybrid musk roses grew, Penelope and Pax and others. They were allowed to grow into large, loosely trimmed bushes hanging over the river, loveliest with their clusters of cream and white and rose pink flowers just as the light began to fade. Planted near them, Lilium regale, tobacco flowers and night scented stalks filled the evening air with scent. So it was a really intoxicating, seductive environment. And it, as I said, it attracted lots of different people, including um, here's, you know, here's some of the people that, that hung out in Bromfield's garden. In the top left, you have um, Gertrude Stein and Alice Toklas in the jungle room where Bromfield painted the murals. Um, in the photo to the right of that is uh, the fashion designer Elsa Scaparelli. Below you have the, uh, the New Yorker correspondent Janet Flanner. And there's the, um, to the right of her, this, the um, stage and screen actress, Ina Clare. So uh, a lot of bold faced names in Bromfield's garden. Um, one of his, his great friends from this period was, uh, as I mentioned, Gertrude Stein. Um, and there are these remarkable letters um, that I, uh, that I, that I read in, in the library at OSU, in fact, um, where, uh, you know, as much as they're kind of talking about the news of the day, about politics, um, uh, about art, uh, they're talking a lot about gardening. And Stein is kind of asking Bromfield to, sh to, to share um, his opinion about how to improve her, her vegetable patch and inviting him down to um, her summer house um, to revamp the gardens there. So Bromfield's enthusiasm for gardening was kind of infectious, um, and it it, it 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 was really the basis of his friendship with another famous American expatriate writer, Edith Wharton. Um, uh, Wharton had very um, elaborate formal gardens um, uh, in a town not too far from Saint Louis called Saint Brice sous Forêt, and um, you know they. They developed a, a very beautiful friendship, um, uh, Wharton and Bromfield, where they lunched with garden designers and traded cuttings and seeds and sent kind of competitive notes to each other. Um, and after Wharton died, Bromfield uh, wrote a, a, um, a kind of memoir, which he never finished, but it has this nice line about his friendship with Bart Wharton, where he said, we seldom discussed our writing, but we talked frequently and at great length of our dahlias and petunias, our green peas and lettuces. So, um, uh, but Bromfield saw, you know, Warden, we had this idea that she's kind of this um, decorous figure, you know, that she's commenting on society, that she's very um, civilized and refined, but the truth, but Bromfield thought he saw a different side of her through her um, interest in gardening and as someone who intensely loved the earth. And it, he was reminded of somebody else from his childhood in Ohio who um, also had a deep connection with the earth. And he called this, this, this deep, almost mystical connection with the land, touched, which is a variant of um, the word touched, as in a little crazy. Um, and that word came to him from his eccentric cousin, distant cousin, Phoebe Wise, who grew up, uh, who, who he, he um, encountered as a boy growing up around Mansfield, Ohio. Um, 
and he she lived in she's this kind of interesting character who I thought was maybe like fictional until I found newspaper clippings from around the turn of the century um, where you know people were writing about her and it was very clear that she did exist. Here's a photograph of her later in life, but she's kind of like a mix of you know, Miss Havisham and a, a scarecrow or something. Uh, she lived in a little cottage um, that was like, had these crazy overground, overgrown uh, gardens. Uh, and Bromfield visited as a boy and used to play in the gardens. And she had kept all these um, wild animals, including this young horse um, that Bromfield developed a kind of friendship with. And they were, uh, you know, playing with water and, and you know, he was kind of losing himself in, the, in, in, in just this pattern of life that was growing wild around Phoebe's, um, around Phoebe's cottage. And she came out of the house, Bromfield's father was there, and she said, cousin Charlie, that boy is touched, meaning that you know, Bromfield had this strange mystical connection to the earth. He defines it as an inner sense of mystical feeling, which makes people one with nature. Um, Wharton, in her memoir, um, didn't use the word touched, but she described something very similar. She was talking about also an experience from her childhood where she was wandering around the woods in Westchester County, and she felt something in me quite incommunicable to others that was tremblingly and inarticulately awake to every detail of wind warped fern and wide eyed briar rose, a unifying magic beneath the diversities of the visible scene, a power with which I was in deep and solitary communion whenever I was alone with nature. So I love that line. And I think that it, you know, beautifully articulates Bromfield's idea of text. Um, as much as Bromfield admired um, Br Wharton's formal gardens, he was ultimately more appealed by the kind of rustic peasant style gardening um, that his neighbors were doing in saint -Lys. And there's a guy named P.K. pictured in this photograph on the bottom left who taught him everything he knew about gardening. Um, and Bromfield really, um, uh, learned from PK um, a kind of reverence for the soil, a kind of French frugality, a style of composting. Um, uh, you know how to how to how to um, extend the growing season um, and and really make the most out of the land. Um, and that made, left a very deep impression on him. Uh, he was struck by the fact that the land he was cultivating in France. Um, you know, had been worked for 10 centuries and it seemed to be as fertile as ever before when the countryside where he grew up in Ohio um, had only been farmed for a few generations, but in many cases was badly eroded in terrible condition. And, you know, this Bromfield is living in Saint Louis in the 1930s at a moment when the um, you know the world is in crisis. This is of course the time of the Dust um, Bowl um, in the in the in the Great Plains, uh, but there's, it's also the time of widespread soil erosion um, across the United States. Here's a, an eroded cotton field in Alabama. So you know. Bromfield's kind of reflecting on all of this and he decides to write a novel that kind of traces his family's experience with the land. It's called a novel, but it's really very close to autobiography. It's called The Farm and it comes out in 1933 and it really marks a shift in his work where he's much more passionate and focused about these questions of, uh, I don't know, um, uh, agriculture and maybe even even something of a kind of proto sustainability mindset here that, that, that's coming out of, out, of, out of this book. This is a, a very romantic treatment of the kind of agrarian lifestyle of his um, grandparents, um, but it ends very bitterly with his own experience trying to save his grandfather's farm in Ohio as a teenager and that um, effort ended in failure, and then Bromfield ended up going off to, to Cornell to study journalism. He volunteered for, for the Ambulance Corps in World War I and kind of got sucked into the writing life, only to later, as we'll discover, find his way back to the land. But this book marks uh, a, an important shift, and he starts talking to his friends more and more, not only about 
you know, gardening, but about farming um, and the, 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 the nobility um, of that lifestyle. And this scandalizes Wharton uh, a little bit, despite her, her deep connection to the earth. Um, in 1933, she says to him, I wish that writing a book called The Farm wouldn't immediately make you decide to buy one. If action always follows so rapidly on thought, you will have an agitated existence and so will Mary. Um, one more, one more uh, important facet to Bromfield's life before he returns to Ohio that we have to discuss is his connection to India. And of course, this is the, um, the reason why he eventually names Malabar his farm Malabar, Malabar. Um, uh, he goes to, he takes two long trips to India in the 1930s. He um, is exposed to the ideas of Albert Howard who's pictured in the below left, uh, considered to be the founding father of the organic movement. He also gets material for some of his best known um, uh, novels, including um, the Rains Came, which comes out in 1937, is a huge hit. It's turned into a blockbuster movie, and you can see um, uh, a photograph of, of, of moviegoers in New York City lined up to see this uh, adaptation of Bromfield's novel. So, you know, he was already really a household name in America um, at this point. He also, incidentally, is, a, is a, a crazy animal lover, and he fell in love with a mongoose while in, in India um, and brought the animal back to France, uh, where it was a big hit in the garden. Um, so, okay, now let's move to Ohio. The winter of 1938, Bromfield sees what's happening in Europe. He's disgusted with Neville Chamberlain's Chamberlain's policy of appeasement. He, 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 he wants to go home. Uh, he wants to raise his children on an honest to God farm. You know, he's one of America's great literary lights, but he's not going to New York. He's not going to Hollywood. He's going to rural Ohio. And he's looking for his dream farm, but the, um, the countryside near his native city of Mansfield is covered in snow. But he finds an old stone farmhouse and he decides to buy it and all of the adjacent pastures. Um, and he begins these very um, uh, ambitious plans to build a kind of Greek revival style um, farmhouse here. Um, but then the snow melts in the spring of 1939 and Bromfield discovers that the 600 or so acres that he bought are totally worthless. Um, <laughs> um, you know, the, 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 the soil had um, eroded. There were gigantic gullies so big you could lose a horse inside them. Bromfield was totally overwhelmed and bitterly disappointed. He didn't know what to do. None of his experience up to this point with gardening or working on his grandfather's farm um, prepared him to reclaim these 600 acres. So he luckily was able to hire as his farm manager, a young man named Max Drake, who had studied agriculture at OSU and was also a county extension agent. Um, and Drake set about modernizing Malabar um, and trying to restore the land. And he was connected with some New Deal era organizations like the Soil Conservation Service and the Civilian Conservation Corps. And he thought that his position as farm manager gave him the latitude to make some big changes. So Bromfield had gone off to Hollywood as he tended to do. Uh, his books were being adapted um, uh, into movies as I mentioned. And he came back from Hollywood and discovered that his farm was kind of unrecognizable. And there were these bulldozers plowing gullies and the land was being refit. And Bromfield kind of exploded at Drake and um, was very angry uh, that he took it upon himself to kind of change the shape of the farm. Um, but after he cursed him out, he kind of cooled off, came back and then said to Drake, what are you doing here? And this began the process by which Bromfield kind of learned the tenets of what we would call like soil conservation or regenerative agriculture. And, um, and then he um, slowly converted the land um, and in the process kind of experienced a profound conversion himself. Um, 
And Malabar became um, extremely productive and beautiful, a kind of uh, model farm. And Bromfield promoted a lot of soil saving techniques that are really now the bedrock of the sustainable agriculture. And these are things like the use of cover crops and contour plowing and uh, large scale composting, even some experiments with no-till agriculture or grass farming. And we, we can talk about some of these things if they're of, of interest to you. Uh, I'm not sure how many agricultural folk I have in the audience. Um, but um, uh, he, he, he was really passionate about these ideas and he was passionate about reaching all types of people, both ordinary farmers who are already are engaged in agriculture at a large scale and who maybe needed help adopting some, some new ideas, but also people kind of back to the landers, people who are interested coming out of, the, out of World War II, uh, you know, and interested in the life of agri uh, 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 the, life, the life of a farmer. Uh, and, um, you know, um, there was a determination never to let some of the terrible agricultural, economic, and ecological disasters that happened in the 1930s happen again. And, and, and part of that process led to the creation of a fantastically interesting organization that is mostly forgotten today called the Friends of the Land um, that brought together a lot of like-minded conservationists. Bromfield was only one of them. These are people like Hugh um, Bennett and Aldo Leopold and Paul Sears. And um, they kind of mainstreamed environmentalism. They, they, they published books, they uh, um, released documentaries in, in conjunction with the, um, the Soil Conservation Service. And then Bromfield went on these national barnstorming speaking tours. Um, he was such a charismatic figure and he was able, this is a, this is a photograph of him at the, the highest point at, Ma at his farm Malabar, Mount G's. And he would, he would bring these, um, like this flock of, 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 of interested people or, or disciples um, and, and kind of preach the gospel of soil conservation. Um, he also, um, years before Rachel Carson, warned Americans about an over-reliance on, um, on pesticides and understood that it wasn't only the danger that these substances posed in themselves, but the way that they um, upset the natural kind of balance of nature and began an arms race where you had to develop ever more powerful um, chemicals to deal with the natural resistance that pests um, had. Um, so he was a, he, he was um, a very far-seeing um, in terms of his uh, many of his agricultural um, ideas, but not all, not all. <laughs> um, during World War II, he had tremendous influence on agricultural policy, perhaps too much influence, and he actually began a, a, a national scare um, uh, that there was going to be a, a, a major food famine. He was so concerned about the, um, the bureaucracy and the red tape of the, of the New Deal um, um, and how it was complicating the wartime food situation. He actually wrote an, an article in um, Reader's Digest that freaked out a lot of people called, we aren't going to have enough to eat. Um, and um, uh, he Anyways, he, he upset the FDR administration, um, but his advocacy caused a lot of noise and, 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 and eventually got deferments for farm workers and increased production for farm machinery. Um, so though the famine that he predicted never arrived, thankfully, and he was ridiculed for it, um, he said that it was worth it um, because of what they managed to achieve as a result of this kind of publicity campaign. Um, another one of his, um, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting because I, I spent a lot of time in researching this book um, in, in, in Richland County, Ohio. And I would mention to people who lived in Pleasant Valley, the area where Bromfield, um, Bromfield's farm is, uh, you know, aren't you proud that you have this, um, 
this pioneer of uh, environmentalism and sustainable agriculture and Pulitzer Prize winning novelist um, associated with, you know, this neck of the woods. And they would be like, oh, Bromfield, yeah, he's the guy who brought multiflora rose here. <laughs> um, I, as some of you might know, multiflora rose is an invasive species which has tortured generations of farmers and backyard gardeners. Um, and it grows wild and, 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 and is actually um, a real nuisance to deal with. Um, but it actually, it wasn't Bromfield's idea to advocate for this. It was uh, the policy of the Soil Conservation Service. It just shows how um, effective he was in spreading some of these ideas that he still blamed um, for this, um, even though the best minds at the time thought that multiflora, as you'll see in this period advertisement, was a, a great solution to create a kind of living fence that could cut down on erosion and separate um, pastures. It was, it was dense enough to um, basically keep livestock, um, you know, uh, from, from, from going through the, the, this living fence. Um, Malabar is pro perhaps best known today as the site of the 1945 wedding um, of Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall. Um, Bromfield and, and Bogart were very good friends. But I think that um, as much as they were good friends and as much as uh, Bromfield and his family were so charmed by Lauren Bacall, who visited before the wedding, there was a, a kind of savviness to Bromfield where he was like, he, he realized that he could use this celebrity wedding to bring more attention to his environmental and agricultural crusade. Um, so I, I um, you know, as, as, as some of you um, probably know from reading Bromfield, um, he, he's uh, an extremely entertaining writer when it comes to agriculture and describing some of the antics at Malabar. But I think the person who captured the farm the best is probably E.B. White, um, who wrote a review of Bromfield's second agricultural memoir, Malabar Farm, um, in, in The New Yorker. Uh, and the review was in verse. And I want to read you one stanza, which will give you a sense of the atmosphere at Malabar. Um, so this is E.B. White. A farm is always in some kind of tizzy, but Bromfield's place is really busy. Strangers arriving by every train, Bromfield terracing against the rain, catamounts crying, mowers mowing, guest rooms full to overflowing, boxers in every room of the house, cows being milked to Brahms and Strauss, kids arriving by van and pung, Bromfield up to his eyes in dung, sailors, trumpeters, mystics, actors, all of them wanting to drive the tractors, all of them eager to husk the corn, some of them sipping their drinks till morn. Anyways, um, thank you so much for your time and um, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Or uh, I think Julie, I, we're gonna have a little chat first actually. Yes, um, so thank you, Stephen. That was really fascinating. Um, and we definitely will have time for q and I thought we could just spend a little bit of time right now um, talking about sort of the, the process of researching and writing your book now that you've given us a bit of context of like who Bromfield was and what he accomplished. Um, so I wanna start with asking you, um, I'd love to hear you talk about your decision to write and um, the process of also writing the biography of someone who was a major public figure in his day, but is now really not known at all. Um, yes. What are the sort of challenges and maybe even advantages of taking on this kind of project? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, the early stages were full of excitement and doubt because I knew, you know, with some notable exceptions in the academy, Bromfield had been like almost entirely neglected for several generations. Um, you know, very little had been written about him. Um, and I was coming at the story as not an expert, uh, you know, in, um, on, on agricultural environmental history and not an expert in early, you know, in 20th century liter literature. So I was kind of like, you know, who am I to, 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 to write this book? But then I was realizing, 
well, if I don't do it, who else is going to do it? Because I'm really struck by this guy's life. And I think that there is something intensely modern about his, um, his story that, you know, it's a lot of the issues and the problems that Bromfield identified are still with us today. So I would say, so at a, at a certain point, I realized Though I might not have the um, you know expertise as judged by some like unseen tribunal of agronomists and <laughs> and literary scholars, um, I can I can try to convey to the reader why it is that I'm enthusiastic about this guy and uh, um, you know just as a human being. Um, and once I made that decision, I was able to proceed. Um, but it was. It was a challenging subject um, for a first book. And I didn't want the book to be written for people who already knew Bromfield. I really wanted it to kind of introduce him to a new generation, so to speak. Thank you. That was, um, that was a very fascinating answer because I was <laughs> thinking about, you took it in a very different direction because I was kind of thinking about like, what are the, what are the hurdles of like convincing um, a publisher or even readers to, to oh, have yeah. an interest in, in this person who, you know, there may or may not be a, a market for. Yeah, I mean, that's difficult. You know, like I, I, I wrote a, a book proposal. I had to find an agent. We had to, you know, we approached different publishers. The, in terms of uh, you know, that not everyone saw the, the promise, but the exciting thing is a lot of people did. And a lot of people felt like, you know, how had this story been hiding in plain sight? And that's how I felt. And that is such a gratifying thing when you think something is, is fabulous and you're like, I don't know if anyone else does, but then they do and you're like, yay. <laughs> um, so that happened on a few occasions um, during the early days of the book. But in terms of how you write that, um, you know, what I wanted to do in the first kind of third was to use his famous friends as a kind of scaffolding. You ha so you because Bromfield's life has this kind of zealot like quality. He's popping up in all of these places and at all these moments that are very important. So I, I was so I, I kind of began that way. And then all of a sudden, he his struggle and his journey kind of come into focus and you realize that, oh, it's not, you know, it's not this kind of like lost generation society gad about um, who we're reading about, but actually somebody who's like grappling with really important issues that are, that are, that are, that are still resonant today. Okay, that's great, thank you. Um, so your research for your book led you to pretty much literally follow in Bromfield's footsteps. So he lived in France and I know you went to visit his home there. Um, and you also spent time at his farm in Mansfield. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about um, the importance of visiting places your subject lived when, when writing this biography and were there insights that you were able to gain by physically being in these spaces? Yes, I mean, I think with the case of Malabar, it, you know, for those of you who haven't visited, especially since you're close, I would, I would really encourage it. It is a beautiful place to like walk around. There, there are magnificent nature paths. You could hunt morel mushrooms, which is something that Brompton really like to do. They have livestock. They, you know, they grow crops. Um, it's not necessarily the most um, you know, ambitious uh, test site for new ideas in regenerative agriculture, but um, his spirit is still there um, and his farmhouse is still there and it's preserved. Um, uh, I went into his office, I saw the bed where Bogey and Bacall spent their wedding night. Um, and um, so that was fantastic in terms of being able to reconstruct, you know, where your subject lived. Um, and, uh, and they still have papers. I mean, the vast majority of Bromfield's papers are at Ohio State, but there's some material at, at, at the farm. So that was very helpful. The France visit was really just an excuse to drink wine and eat good food. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But, um, you know, the, his garden, actually the structure is still there and it was interesting to see. Um, although the garden doesn't look anything like it did in Bromfield's day, 
Um, I did meet some uh, neighbors of his who were children uh, at the time when he was living um, and who had kind of foggy memories of Bromfield. And I love that living link to your subject, even if those observations didn't work their way into the book exactly. So you just referenced spending some time at the Rare Books and Manuscripts Library with the Bromfield yes. papers. So I'd love to talk a little bit more about that. Um, so I guess maybe we could start with just the basics. Um, had you done archival research before? Was this something that you had done sort of as a writer and journalist and it was familiar or was it kind of an unknown? Um, and was that no. something you were even looking forward to? Yeah, I didn't, um, I hadn't really done any significant archival research for this book. I mean, sometimes when I, if I was working on a story that touched on history, I would do a little bit, but nothing like this. And I had no idea about how, how much I would love it. Like, you know, I think that you, maybe you don't necessarily know whether you're like a creature of the archives until you get in there. Um, but I found that days would just fly by. It was so exciting. I was like, you know, I felt like I was the hero of some detective story, you know, and I was, you know, I was so excited about what was going to be in the next box. I also had the sense, and this is not always true, um, but it's one of the benefits of working on, on somebody who's kind of obscure, that I was like, that no one else was looking through this stuff. I mean, that might be an exaggeration. I'm sure people are doing, are, are, are looking at it to an extent, but like, some of the boxes and some of the folders have felt like they no one had been through since Bromfield's time or, or, or thereabout. And um, that was exciting. It was also, it also gave me a sense of, um, a sense of obligation. Um, you know, there's uh, uh, Robert Caro's line about, you know, how you have to turn every damn page um, when investigating your subject for a biography. That is, there's a lot of pages to turn, you know, <laughs> a lot of boxes. Bromfield wrote 30 um, novels. He wrote radio scripts. He wrote newspaper columns. He wrote recipes and, uh, you know, every flower in his garden in saint Lys is listed in a, in a, you know, he had these magnificent photo scrapbooks that his wife put together. It's an enormous quantity of material. Um, and I would take these kind of week long research trips. I took probably a half a dozen or more where I'd rent an Airbnb. This was in the days when you could go places and, um, and you know, spend every day in the library, just kind of photographing. Um, I mean, I think that there was probably a time maybe recently with archival research where you actually had to spend maybe months reading through stuff because it wasn't practical to uh, photograph everything, but I could do it very quickly. So it was really more of a process of selection. And then when I got home, I would have to do the difficult work of kind of going through and absorbing all this material, determining what was important. Sorting through, I assume, thousands and thousands of photos that you had taken yes. just hours before. That's right. Um, I mean, I should say that a lot of the images that I use in my slideshow come from Bromfield scrapbooks, which, if any of you are interested in this story, are a real thrill to, uh, to look through. So I feel like you've you started to kind of talk about this a little bit, but um, I, I wonder if you can say a bit more about um, what you discovered about Bromfield and his life from his archives that you didn't find elsewhere. Oh, well, I mean, it really, the whole life was there. I mean, the, 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 um, the Bromfield papers were the core of the research. And um, let me just think about what I would, you know, among the important things that I found were, um, these unpublished farm journals, um, which is a Bromfield kind of sitting as typewriter and um, typing out a few sentences about the weather, about what it was like to, you know, uh, mow a field of Ladino clover and the insects are coming up and the sun is, you know, like th these kind of uh, textural, visceral details of the of the everyday of farming. And I was able to kind of, a lot of this material had never been published and I was able to kind of 
cobble it together along with some um, journal entries from his daughter, Ellen, who kind of followed in Bromfield's footsteps and describe each season at Malabar. There's a chapter in my book called Four Seasons of Malabar. And so that was something that I was able to do um, as a result of material that I found in the library. And I thought it was important because, you know, things happen on a farm in, 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 in a, but, you know, things happen in 1952 versus 1953, but it's really a seasonal thing. From season to season, the changes are, 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 are important. And that kind of gradual change was something I really wanted to capture. So that material allowed me to do that. Fantastic. Um, so I'm looking at the Q&A box and I see a yeah. lot of questions coming in. Okay. So I want to make time to get to those. Um, and there's one that actually I, I was hoping to ask you as well. So that's, this is a great segue um, and it's, um, basically asking about his writing, both his novels and nonfiction. If you have a particular uh, piece that you would recommend um, for anyone who would be interested in learning more or getting started learning about who Bromfield was and what his writing's about. Yeah, I would, the, the, I think the gateway drug for Bromfield would probably be this, this story, My 90 Acres from his first, uh, agricultural memoir, Pleasant Valley, which was published in 1945. And it's a, a very tender star story about a farmer, which may or may not have been based on uh, a neighbor of Bromfield's, but it's very closely aligned to this idea of touched. Um, I don't want to tell you too much about it because I don't want to um, ruin it. Um, but I think that that story really captures his love for the land and his almost creative approach to, to, to agriculture and to thinking about landscape. Um, you know, part of the goal of my book is to kind of like, you think of literature as an, as a, as an art form and agriculture probably is something else. And I wanna kind of like confuse those ideas a little bit as, as the book goes on. And I, cause I do think that Bromfield had a kind of a creative or artistic, you know, sense of vocation when it came to farming. Um, so uh, that's where I would begin if you're interested in the agricultural stuff. And the novels are fun. I mean, there's a lot of good stuff. Um, I like The Rains Came a lot. It's very long. I think it's over long, but I think it really conveys his enthusiasm for India. Um, and, um, um, and I think that Early Autumn, the book that won the Pulitzer is, um, is interesting too. Um, I mean, but I, but, but I think the My 90 Acres is a great place to start. Okay, the challenge is just getting them because some of his, a lot yeah. of his work is, is out of print. Um, okay, so another great question I see here is, um, I'm an agricultural econom economist, um, not very familiar with Bromfield. I'm curious, based on your research, what unique factors contributed to Bromfield's progressive approach to agriculture? Um, you mentioned his experience in France, um, but is, is, is that all it was or were there other factors as well? Well, as I mentioned, I think Bromfield found himself at a, like in a place that a lot of American farmers were at a moment when the country was trying to change its approach to the land and to get new ideas and new practices out to farmers. You know, he was came back to America in 1938. The Soil Conservation Service had already been established. He was linked up to that guy, Max Drake, and they were kind of putting, you know, new ideas into practice at scale. And so Bromfield saw the potential of some of these ideas. And once they worked for him at Malabar, he was like, let's continue to spread them around um, because, you know, he was interested, and this is, I think, something that distinguishes him from someone like J.I. Rodale, um, whose, you know, ideas of organic agriculture mostly appealed to a kind of like wealthy, elite, suburban audience, at least initially. Uh, Bromfield was interested in agriculture that scaled, um, and he was looking at these, you know, he was looking at 
um, an over-reliance on chemical fertilizer, but he also knew that you couldn't completely eliminate that from the equation. You know, it wasn't practical even then to go completely organic. So there was a sense of him really grappling with these with these ideas in a in a in a in, in a in a big way. Great. Um, okay, another very interesting question. Given that Lewis Bromfield was such a successful author and a pioneer of conservation, why do you think that many people today haven't heard of him? And this person mentions, I grew up in Ohio and I didn't know anything about him until I was an adult and happened to stay at a youth hostel near his farm on a bike trip yeah. I took. I mean, it's such a good question. And I, you know, deal with it a little bit in the book, you know, the question of why he was forgotten. I mean, my best guess, is that he was kind of, that there was a kind of canceling out that happened, you know. Um, the literary critics kind of soured on him because they didn't understand his farm. They thought it was the plaything of a dilettante. And they, you know, thought that he wasn't being serious enough about agriculture. You know, farmers were confused by his high society in Hollywood, you know, high society connections, Hollywood friends. Um, you know, Bromfield's politics were all over the map. Um, it was so liberal in the 20s and 30s that he was thought to be a communist. But then when he got back in the 40s and 50s, he was extremely, you know, he was, he, he was right of center and like very, um, he could be very polemical. Um, he was a complicated and, you know, not entirely attractive guy who alienated a lot of people. Uh, he wrote a lot of garbage, let's be honest. I mean, a lot of his books are beautiful and, and passionate, and then some are considerably less so. He wrote a lot of stuff to finance his farm. Um, and so you're, you end up, and then he, he got sick and died very suddenly. Um, and his, he left his farm eventually, uh, it, it passed on to the state of Ohio, but there wasn't a foundation that was pursuing his mission or anything. And so all of these things kind of eroded his, his legacy. And I think it's only with the benefit of, of some distance that we can kind of appreciate his project um, and see hopefully how, how relevant he still is. So uh, sort of building off of that, this is a somewhat related question. So this person says, thank you for the wonderful presentation. And what kind of outcomes are you hoping this book will spark in the modern era? Oh, goodness. I mean, I don't <laughs> know. I just, I would be grateful if more people knew about Bromfield and um, um, understood how deep the, deeply rooted some of these agricultural problems are and how we've been having a, you know, with some significant variations, uh, a, a very similar conversation since the kind of industrialization of agriculture. And we still have kind of failed to get it right. Um, and I think the consequences that are only increasing in time. So I hope he could be, uh, you know, uh, an inspiration to, you know, um, conversations that need to be happening more and more. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> okay, totally different uh, track here. Um, this person would like you to talk about the proto-feminist quality of his fiction. And I know oh. you talk a bit in the book about how he, he goes on speaking to her specifically about this. Yeah, I mean, this is kind of obnoxious, but like Bromfield was considered to be the man who, the man who knows women in the 1920s. And he went on speaking tours um, where he described his idea of the new woman, um, a kind of, uh, you, you know, I mean, Bromfield thought that, um, uh, you, you know, um, women who wanted to pursue creative work, uh, professional life should be able to do so. Um, and that marriage and family should have the same place in, in women's lives that it does in the lives of, of men. In that respect, I think he was something of a proto-feminist. And I think that he was drawn to women all his life. You know, I mentioned Phoebe Wise, Wharton, Stein. He also had a very interesting relationship with Doris Duke. Um, you know, they bonded over horticulture 
Um, she had a, a, a very big farm in, in, in New Jersey. They ended up falling in love after Bromfield's wife um, uh, died. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think that there, there is something there is something there. I mean, the novels, and, and, there, and it's conspicuous that he wrote mostly novels from the perspective of women. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know. I'm not qualified to determine whether they are, they should be, you know, actually labeled proto-feminist. I use the word because that's how they strike me. But, um, but yeah, I think that, uh, I think that he was not at all scandalized by the idea of a liberated woman. In fact, I think that he was attracted to that and, 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 and loved to be around strong women. That was one of the fascinating parts of his story as I was reading your book because um, I, I don't know, I found myself kind of wondering how that fit in with his relationship with his wife, which seems oh, yeah. like <laughs> sometimes he wasn't, it didn't seem like he necessarily always gave her the credit or respect that she deserved. Yeah. I mean, it was a, that was a, it was a bad marriage. Um, you know, I think that his wife had a, was suffered from depression. She felt extremely inadequate, um, very um, uncomfortable in her own skin. And you know, she was very retreating and shy by nature, but she was also interested in becoming a writer. And in her younger years had written for Vogue um, and other kind of women's magazines. But over the years, she kind of became more and more aloof, even reclusive. Um, and she wasn't in good health. And Bromfield, you know, it's interesting. I, there, I mentioned how much material has survived, um, but all of Bromfield's correspondence with his wife is one-sided. We only have her letters to him. We don't have his letters to her. So we don't know how he spoke to her, but we know that she was in a great deal of pain, that she was often jealous, that she was not happy about his, his, his affairs and things like that. And so, yeah, he was, you know, he was a lover of, uh, of, of, of women and believed in women's rights, but he was a terrible husband. <laughs> So I think we have time maybe just for one more question. Um, and I, I love this one. So the person asks, um, now that you realize you're a creature of the archive, I know some, from personal experience um, that you're likely eager to find the next archival adventure. So what is in store for you? Oh, well, I don't know. I mean, I have, um, I actually have another subject in my crosshairs, but it's too soon to talk about. Um, but I, I love biography and I feel like I could write these things all my life. I, um, yeah, and, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I hope that my, um, my next subject will take me back to Ohio State University and, um, and the wonderful <laughs> archives there. <laughs> um, that is a lovely note to end on. Uh, so I'd like to just wrap up by thanking our guest, Stephen Heyman. Um, thank you to Ian for organizing this for us. And thank you all of our attendees and the um, really great questions today. Yes, thank you so much. I really appreciate it.